There are over 4,000 frog species on our planet, but more than one third of species are considered to be threatened with extinction. It's a bad sign with frogs playing key roles in our ecosystem. But even more interestingly, we're starting to learn how frogs are helping scientists develop some new innovations in the medical field. This is one of Australia's very own green tree frogs. He might look little, but he's a mean green fighting machine. He's just one frog species known to secrete protective chemicals from his skin that have antibacterial and antiviral properties. You can see he has this glossy appearance and he feels really moist and that's because of these sticky secretions that he's producing from his skin. Frogs live across very harsh environments so it's important for them to have a strong immune system to survive there and compared to other animals, their immune system is one of the best. What does this mean for us? Well, scientists are now screening frog skin as a rich source of germ-fighting chemicals and they're discovering how some chemicals can be turned into useful antibiotics. Because of the unique way these antibiotics work, they even make it difficult for germs to develop antibiotic resistance. Today, the World Health Organization describes antibiotic resistance as an urgent global health priority. In the US, it's reported that 2 million people fall ill each year due to antibiotic resistant infections, and over 20,000 of these cases are fatal. Scientists all around the world are studying how frogs can help us make better antibiotics, including groups in Australia. I'm about to learn more about antibiotic resistance from microbiologist Dr. Sue Ellen Egan. Here at the University of New South Wales, she's studying how we can make new antibiotics, helping to overcome drug resistance. How urgent is it to develop new antibiotics at the moment? Uh, I think it's extremely urgent. And mostly it's because we have a situation where on one hand we have more and more bacteria that are medically important gaining resistance to antibiotics that we currently have. But on the other hand, we have a slowing down of the rate in which we're discovering new antibiotics. So how do bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics? Okay. Well, bacteria will naturally want to protect themselves from being killed by antibiotics. And so they've evolved several mechanisms to be able to do that. For example, uh, they can change the target of that antibiotic in, that's in the cell, and they do that via genetic mutations. They can produce an enzyme or something that can degrade that antibiotic before it gets into the cell. And the third most common mechanism is to increase the amount that they can pump that antibiotic out of the cell. So it must be quite a challenge for someone like you. You're developing new antibiotics to help overcome um, resistant bacteria like this. So what exactly do you do to try to develop the new best antibiotic? Okay, well, as I said, nature has also made a counterpart to that. And so we believe that by looking to our amazing biodiversity that we have here, we can actually find these new antibiotics and new mo molecules. Um, for example, we at the Centre for Marine Bioinnovation here are looking at the marine environment and we look at things like sponges and seaweeds and other marine bacteria to identify new novel antibiotics. Other researchers and groups uh, look at terrestrial animals and how they defend themselves from pathogenic bacteria. Uh, for example, some research groups are looking at tree frogs. To see whether new molecules from creatures like sponges or frogs could actually be used as effective antibiotics, Sue Ellen explains how scientists have a special way to test this out. This is a, what's called an antibiotic sensitivity assay. Um, and what we'll do is we'll first add our bacteria to our agar plate where the bacteria will grow. Um, here. Spread that around like so and then we can add our antibiotic discs to here. So here we have some little discs which contain different antibiotics. Okay. Um, and we, we take those, we place them onto our agar plates. Yes. And then we leave those plates then to incubate for the bacteria to grow for a couple of days. Yep. Um, and in the end, what we'll find is once they've grown, if we have an antibiotic, um, that is effective, we'll see this halo around the outside yep. of that disc where the bacteria haven't been able to grow because of that antibiotic. And in this case here, we have one where the bacteria has been, is resistant to that antibiotic. And you see the bacteria will grow on this agar plate all the way up to where that disc is. 
And how quickly can resistance to antibiotics like this one happen? Well, it really depends on the rate of exposure to the antibiotic. Um, a classic example, though, is when penicillin in the 1940s was first prescribed. Um, it only took about 10 years for resistance to start to develop. And in that way, it's really important part of the uh, important part of the solution to antibiotic resistance is really education around the generation of antibiotic resistance and also restrictions on the overuse and misuse of antibiotics in order to relieve that selection pressure that the bacteria have to gain resistance. Overcoming drug-resistant microbes is clearly a big problem. Since frogs are one solution to this problem, it's important to understand how frogs go about their day-to-day -day life and how we can help conserve the biodiversity of frogs that we have on our planet. I'm here at the Australian Museum to catch up with frog biologist Jody Rowley. Frogs are pretty special creatures, especially since they're helping us to unlock new medical applications like antibiotic treatment. How important is it for us to help conserve frogs in the wild so that we can keep learning from them? Well, frogs are a really important part of ecosystems and unfortunately in some places in the world where amphibians have disappeared or had dramatic declines, we actually know what kind of effects they have. Energy flow, nutrient transfer, the streams clog up with algae without tadpoles around and the predators that used to rely on the amphibians as a food source also go around starving. But most people also don't realise that frogs can have really more direct impacts on human health and this will be increasingly so in the world of drug discovery. What are some of the major threats to frogs around the world? Habitat loss is by far the greatest threat facing frogs around the world. Most frogs really rely on really certain environmental conditions and so when we start mucking it up, even if the habitat looks kind of the same to us, then they're potentially not able to tolerate it anymore. Jody travels all around the world to study frogs to contribute to their long-term conservation and she has even discovered some new frog species of her own. So far, my colleagues and I have discovered 21 new species of amphibians from Southeast Asia, which is a really important increase in our knowledge. So if we don't know what we've got and we don't know how it's doing, it's really difficult to prioritise which protected areas or which species we need to put our conservation resources to. One of the recent frogs you've discovered or been studying is called the vampire frog, is that correct? The vampire flying frog, that, that is correct. So these frogs are flying frogs like... Uh, like this is Helen's flying frog here, uh, mm -hmm. and, and like Helen's flying frog, the vampire flying frog is adapted for life in the canopy. So they have huge hands and feet that are webbed that they can use to glide. And they have, instead of the weird sort of usual little beaky thing that tadpoles often have as mouse, they have black fangs. So they're amongst the strangest, if not the strangest tadpole in the world. I think of frogs as being pretty gentle creatures, but frogs like this produce antimicrobial chemicals to protect themselves. How exactly do they do this? Well, in times of stress, or so when things are particularly, the environment's particularly good uh, for microbes, they will secrete these chemicals, these peptides, through their skin and onto their back and belly. And they have all sorts, depending on the frog, of antiviral, antifungal and antibacterial properties, amongst other things. So just this common Australian green tree frog, Latoria cerulea has over 20 different kinds so far that we know of antimicrobial peptides that they secrete on their skin. Peptides are a simpler form of proteins and Jody explains how every different frog species produces unique types of these antimicrobial peptides. You won't be able to get the same kind of chemicals from one frog as to another and each time you lose a species to extinction you lose the ability to develop drugs from the chemicals in their skin. How come compared to other animals we're discovering all these antimicrobial chemicals in frogs? Probably because of places they hang out. They spend a lot of time in warm, wet places that are really conducive, particularly to fungal and bacteria growth. So because they hang out in these places, they need some kind of defence to, to stop them from becoming infected. How exactly do these antimicrobial proteins work that the frogs are producing? Well, there's a different variety of chemicals that they're producing, but they all seem to act in a much more general manner to a lot of the antibiotics that we're using at the moment. So the thinking is that they will develop antibiotic resistance to these kind of frog antimicrobial peptides a lot more slower, orders of magnitude slower than for traditional antibiotics. There's a bit of a belief that frogs can give you warts. Is this a myth or is it true? 
It's, uh, it's a myth, otherwise I'd be covered, that's for sure. Uh, if anything, it's going to be the opposite. So all the compounds that we're finding on frogs seem to be uh, really effective in curing a lot of human ills. The biggest area of discovery is in the antimicrobial peptides, looking at drugs, particularly as antibiotics. Uh, also, there's a lot of interest in HIV and other viruses and the ability to suppress them. Vasodilation, so looking at heart conditions and how the chemicals on the frogs may be able to help out with that. Um, all, like, incredible amount of stuff um, that are actually being developed. Jody, since you're a frog expert, you should know the answer to this, but is it true that if you kiss a frog it will turn into a prince? Unfortunately, no, otherwise I would have a lot of princes. <laughs>